You're here for Pull Up Pro Phase 2 review, right? Not some elaborate trawl about why I've been slacking, why I've not done the video in time, and all these different excuses and reasons as to why it's took me three and a half months instead of the eight weeks like I said it would at the end of the Phase 1 review, right? Yeah, of course. Cool. So we're all on the same page. In that case, let's not keep you any longer, and let's get to Pull Up Pro Phase 2 review. <laughs> And what's neat about this review as opposed to the phase one review is that I don't have to go over all the ins and outs and the whys as to why I'm doing the program in the first place. So if you haven't seen my phase one review, I'm gonna put a little link somewhere that you can click. Go ahead and watch that review. It'll give you the context of my journey with this program. If you have already watched that review and you're waiting to get into phase two, let's start it off by outlining what's changed between phase one and phase two. Generally speaking, in terms of structure, there aren't any humongous changes to phase two compared to phase one. The one thing that has changed though, is that you are training the one-arm pull-up directly, so the drills for the one-arm pull-up or the one-arm chin-up, twice a week as opposed to once a week. Whereas in phase one, you were doing one session and then you were doing a weighted pull-up session on the side. However, we're still training twice a week, so that hasn't changed. And much of the other exercises haven't changed either. The general structure is still pretty much the same, the parameters have been modified slightly and really you could call this a bit more of an intensification as opposed to phase one as we are step laddering our way through the three phases as I outlined in the phase one review video. And this is the time where we have to cover the subject of what exercises to actually use as your direct exercise for the one-arm chin-up and one-arm pull-up. Now if you have watched my phase one review, you'll remember that I used the same strap assist throughout the bulk of that phase. So that is a subjective assistance method and my plan in that video was to switch to an objective assistance method in the form of the counterweighted version. The plan was to originally run with that throughout the entirety of the phase and push the parameters so in a perfect world I would drop the weight on my assisting strap down and down and down each time I could hit the high end of the rep ranges and like I said in this fantasy world that would have took me from let's say for example 10 kilograms of assistance all the way down to something like two and a half for reps and then all I'd need to do is deload and then try the one arm chin up right sounds good did it happen sadly it didn't happen this is the time where we've got to be honest this is a straight talking channel after all and no we didn't make linear progress now I did start off with the counterweighted version for quite some time so I ran it for the first couple of weeks and I made okay progress but I found for the volume that I had to do I just could not make any progression with the weight that I was using so I was using 10 kilograms for sets of five reps per arm and these were like four sets so it's quite a lot of volume now you may argue that maybe I should have added more uh, assisting weight to it but then I did a little bit of research on the internet and found that some sources were saying that you shouldn't do more than say 10 to 12 kilograms and 15 is a bit much. You should go back to more of the uh, you know, subjective methods and build more capacity there. And this was around the time that I saw other sources, Sonderberg being one of them, I saw his video, which is really interesting, where he was saying that you should throw out all the eccentrics and throw out the intensity methods and just build honest volume and work capacity with the finger assist method. So he was claiming that he basically got a one-arm chin up from getting sort of five to 10 one finger assist, one arm chin up reps. So that was his philosophy. So I thought to myself, maybe there's some truth to this. Maybe I'm pushing the intensity too much. I can't really make any gains here. I'm spinning my wheels and on some sessions, I was actually going backwards. And it is at this point, like I said in the last video, I'm not just running this program. I am juggling a lot of other things going on at the moment. So I've been trying to rehab my elbow and my shoulder injury that I had throughout 2021. That is involving quite a lot of sort of other specific drills for attraction and whatnot. I also have social meetups with friends, so I'm training off the program as well. I'm teaching classes throughout the week for calisthenics and stuff. So there's a lot going on under the umbrella that is my life and my training life. So that is making it quite difficult to, to hit the program in its entirety. Now, obviously, Daniel recommends that you keep your goals to a minimum when using this program for maximum results. So I've got to hold my hands up and kind of just admit that I'm causing probably this slower progress by doing too many things at once, but my lifestyle at the moment is kind of forcing me to do that. And at the end of the day, I'm patient enough to wait. I'll wait, it will take as long as it takes. I'm heavier, I'm nearly 90 kilos. One on chin-ups at those weights is not gonna be easy. It's gonna take some time and look, I'm fine with it. You know, we've got a lifetime to do these things. I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying the slow process, but that is why I think I was spinning my wheels with the counterweighted method. So what did I do instead? 
I went for the finger method, which is one of the ones that Daniel actually endorses in the program for the subjective category. And I know some people criticize this method and say it just gives you really, really strong fingers. Maybe there's some truth to that, but I really found with this method that I could at least kind of guarantee that I was always gonna hit five reps using one finger assist. Obviously some days I'm sure I'm pushing more with a finger than others. And there was also times that I played around with having like more of the finger over it like this and sometimes more of the, the last joint of my finger over the ring if I felt stronger. So that was another little mini variation within a progression itself. And also I did two finger assist with top pauses at the top. Now this was just because I know notoriously I've always been weak around that top point. And as you can see from some of the videos where I'm exploding from the bottom with the one finger assist, I'm just relying on my power from the bottom to get me to the top. But when it comes to trying the real one arm chin up, I'm not gonna have the other hand to assist me to rocket ship my way out. I'm gonna have to really pull and create some torque from that 90 degree angle to where the hand comes all the way towards the chest and your chin goes right above the bottom of the ring or the bar, depending on what you're using. The point is, sometimes you've gotta just take ownership of your own program, put your own spin on it in an intelligent way and choose little mini progressions that are gonna best serve you, as opposed to just blindly following a program. Sometimes it takes experience and a little bit of know-how to do this, but I wasn't afraid to kind of modify and manipulate the program to suit my needs best, as you'll find out later in the video as well, because I did this with a few other moves, but more on that later. Now, I can hear you guys saying, yeah, but it's subjective. It's subjective, it's not objective. You don't know that you're getting any closer than one on chin up. You just think you're getting better and all the time your fingers are getting stronger, right? I can hear you guys saying that. Well, this is where it gets really interesting because I did an experiment. This was my experiment. So what I did is after doing the eight weeks of one finger assisted chin ups and getting better at them, I thought, let's test what my counterweighted strength is like now. Bearing in mind, I hadn't done any counterweight assisted one on chin up work since the first kind of two to three weeks tops of this program. And there's been a good kind of seven, eight, maybe even more than that week since, to be honest with you, because I'm a little bit late doing this video. Like I said, sorry guys, but that was gonna be my experiment. So here's what happened. After a general warm up, I went through the hierarchy of the one on chin up progression. So what I did is I did a couple of reps on the one finger assist. Then I tried the little finger assist. And then after that, I got into the counterweighted reps. So I did a rep with 10 kilo, then came down to five kilo, then tried 2.5 kilo, which you can see here was actually quite a struggle, which I probably shouldn't have done it in this order looking back. Maybe what I should have done in hindsight was just go all in, don't do those reps prior, just save some energy, save some power and gone all out on the 2.5 because I reckon I probably would have got it. As you could see, my chin just missed the bars about, about kind of halfway, maybe just above halfway. And as we know, I'm quite weak at the top anyway, so I just felt like I didn't have enough bite to close the rep on the top on both arms. But the plus side of that is that both arms are equal. So that's a first, whereas obviously in the last video, I was covering the fact that I'd been struggling with the one arm chin ups from sort of one side to the other. You can see that my right arm was a lot more dominant than my left, particularly on things like eccentrics in the past. So now they actually feel quite level. So that is a real plus. So then I went down to the 3.75, and that is pretty much where I was at for one rep. Admittedly, this was after doing a fair few ramp up, like warm up reps. I reckon maybe I could have got that 2.5 if I was fully fresh, bearing in mind I am one of these people that tends to burn out a little bit quick in terms of power. So to wrap this up, package it, finish it and move on, we can conclude that the finger assist method when done intelligently and done repeatedly in a progressive fashion does cross over to the counterweighted version. So you could argue that there is some carryover between the subjective method and the objective method. So that should give you some heart if you're struggling to hit precise numbers on your counterweight week for week for week and beating yourself up about it. Now I know some people will be saying, yeah, but the counterweight method has friction, blah, blah, blah. Granted it does, it's not an absolutely precise way of doing it, but it's, it's decent. For the most part, it's one of the better methods out there, okay? So that should give you some heart here. And yeah, I would have been absolutely gutted if there was no carryover between the two movements. And although it was a, a failure, if you will, the other nice thing about that is, is that I was actually able to lock the rep out higher and pull the actual ring, top of the ring to the, to the lips. I like kiss the ring, as I always say, which is another cue that Daniel Badnell likes. He always insists that you sort of objectively use enough height for it to count. The other times where I'd gone near kind of five kilo or less, I certainly never kissed the top of the ring. So I'd always managed to just get the chin above my hand in that kind of like goose neck, neck extended position, which let's be honest, is nowhere near as pristine and crisp looking as when you pull that ring right in and your lips touch the top of the ring as a marker for height. 
So the point is, although it's a failure and I haven't got a full one on chin yet, you can see that there are marked improvements. Improvement number one, balance between sides, so no longer any asymmetry. Improvement number two, consistent height improvements, whereas before that's always been a big weakness of mine. Locking in at the top and top strength in the shortened range of motion for the back muscles has never ever been one of my strong suits, but I've been grafting, I've been hustling, and I've been working, and as you can see, it's slowly but surely paying off. And some other points of interest and comparisons from phase one compared to phase two. I'll start with weighted pull-ups. That's another area I've changed my approach here. In phase one, I was obsessed with pushing the numbers, really trying to go super, super heavy at all costs and not really thinking about how I was doing the pull-ups. Whereas this time I've kind of realized that they're there as a conditioner, not as a main lift, which is why they feature kind of later in the program. Really, your focus is spent mostly on the one-arm chin-up direct exercises. So it's been nice to not be a complete and utter slave to the numbers, which kind of echoes the sentiments from what I was talking about with the counterweighted stuff. Sometimes that subjectivity is actually a good thing because let's face it, bodies are bodies and not machines or robots. So you can't force them to do certain stuff on certain days when they're just not ready to do that. When it comes to ring rows, that's another area that I've of course still been doing. They are an absolute hidden gem. They're just a beautiful exercise that no one ever really takes as serious as they should. But I've been doing them, or I did this time, instead of going super, super steep and being powerful, I've applied the same concept that you can kind of see that I'm getting at throughout this whole video, which is pausing at the top, pulling the rings to the chest, really locking the elbows back and kind of holding it there, forcing myself to just hold in the position that I'm weakest. We've all seen the fact that I can bounce out the bottom really, really fast, but this really humbled me because I had to really bring my feet down quite low and make the body angle a lot more easy. So I felt like a bit of a beginner again, but the payoff here was just absolutely huge. And what this illustrates is that you're taking these movements and intelligently kind of putting your own stamp on them and using what you think you need and applying what you need to get more out of it for your own individual weaknesses. Obviously, this takes a little bit of know-how and a little bit of experience to identify what you need, but when done correctly, it can have massive, massive results. In phase one, I was doing weighted scapular pulls with above 30 kilos attached to me, which was plenty fine. This time round, I thought, what's the point in adding more and more and more weight to this? As you know, I switched to one arm on some of them, but there's still some two arm hang drills in there. So what I thought is I thought, why don't I do top holds on the pull-up bar? So pull myself to the top, lock in and hold there for the time zones. Obviously I wouldn't need to add weight, Lo and behold, this was an area that also humbled me. As you can see, it's quite difficult. I don't have great elbow flexion, as you can see, just stroking my shoulders is about all I've got. Some of you are gonna watch this and be like, uh, and just push your hand to your shoulder. Damn you, you're the people I hate. I wish I had your elbow flexion, but I don't have that. So it means locking in above the bar requires more retraction and more depression of my scapula to get my chest to really pin in towards that bar and get my chin super high. So that was really humbling. But we've all got to start somewhere. And as soon as I started doing that, I started to see quite good progress here. Obviously at first it was a struggle to keep the chin above the bar, but now I've even been practicing doing some full grip holds with my hands actually on my chest. And my plan eventually down the line would be able to actually hold it without a full grip on the chest, even if that does mean my elbows going way back behind my body compared to people who are able to stroke their own shoulder. Damn you. And last but never least, the rotator cuff. We're just going to touch on that. So obviously Cuban rotations made some great progress in phase one. Instead of going up in weight in phase two, what I've started to do here is I've started to improve the ranges of motion. So traditionally, I always pulled from kind of the horizontal point, which is like the mid-range, and then externally rotated the bar back behind my head. But since meeting up with my friend Ollie back in November, we were doing a lot of different training exercises together and he was doing his all the way down to the chest. He's got a little bit better internal rotation than me. I thought, yeah, maybe I should start doing this, you know, train the internal rotation, kind of uh, eccentrically lengthen the external rotators. I had to drop weight a little bit at first to do this because it was really humbling. But as you can see here now, I'm able to move the Olympic bar four reps pretty comfortably from the chest all the way to the shortened range of motion. So again, progress hasn't necessarily come in the form of weight or sets and reps, but it's came in the form of range of motion. And we all know how important internal shoulder rotation is to just general shoulder health, shoulder mobility, and overall athletic performance regarding the shoulders. So that for me is a massive win and I'll take that all day long.
Okay, we are done and dusted. It took a little bit longer than I wanted it to, or I said it would. I'm sorry again, but you can call me many things. You certainly can't call me not detailed. I've covered everything I'd like to cover. I've shared some of my thought processes that go into kind of how I actually execute the program. I've shared a little bit of a teaser as to what's actually got better and hopefully dangled another carrot so that you want to see my phase three, which a reminder is the final phase another eight week block, which is to come down the line. Of course, I plan on bringing you all of my conclusions, all of my roundups when the time comes. Hopefully it won't take me too long. And also I know that I'll have to probably hone in a little bit more on this last phase as the intensity goes up, as does the frequency, because it's going from two days a week to three days a week. So that is a lot of one arm chin up training, but you can see what Daniel Vadnell's trying to do here is he's basically trying to peak you so that when you deload, you've got your greatest possible chance at getting your best ever one arm chin up or pull up performance to date. So make sure you stay tuned for that. As always guys, thank you for watching the video. If you like the video, click the thumbs up button to show your support for the channel. Consider subscribing if you like this kind of content so far. And with that said, let me know down below in the comments section what you'd like me to cover in terms of content. Is there anything you'd like to see a tutorial on? Like to see an opinion on? Like to see me try? Like to see me review? On the back of that, some people have been asking for a high pull-up tutorial that carries over to muscle-up, so that is in the back of my mind. It is on my project and to-do list, so stay tuned for that in the near future. I've also thought about doing a video on front folding and pancaking, so things that help you kind of compress and loosen up your hamstrings. Some ideas on whether or not you should round your back, straight back versus rounded back training, and just my sort of general take on that. So that's another thing, but I'm always open to ideas, so yeah, have a three-for-all down below, guys. Thanks once again for watching and I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Peace out.